Thank you for coming out on this, uh, on this evening. It's really nice to see so many of you here. And it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you about um, some of our research on autism. So one thing you'll all know about autism is that autism is headline news. You can scarcely open a newspaper without finding some story about autism, whether it's the claim for a cure, the claim that people have found the genes for autism, uh, the MMR um, uh, scandal a while back, the idea that MMR caused autism, which has uh, had the knock-on effect of the measles epidemics now, uh, or the claim that autism is really growing in prevalence and that we have an autism epidemic. When I started researching autism more than 20 years ago, autism was thought of as a rare condition. But we know now that autism isn't rare, that it affects around 1% of children and adults. And uh, that means around 600,000 people in the UK. And later on in the talk, I'll come back to talking about adults with autism. It's probably important to remember that most people with autism are adults. And according to the Office of National Statistics Household Survey, most adults with autism are undiagnosed. We know that autism is a neurodevelopmental condition. Uh, autism typically shows up before age three, although diagnosis can be much later in life. It shows a spectrum of manifestations, which I'll talk about in a moment. It affects many more males than females, and we'll return to that later in the, the talk. And many people with autism also have epilepsy, particularly epilepsy that starts um, around adolescence, which is an unusual pattern. And uh, many people with autism have intellectual disability as well. Now, we know that autism is a genetically uh, affected condition, that it's highly heritable, um, and it's sometimes believed to be the most heritable, heritable of all developmental conditions. In the early days of autism research, people thought you might be able to make your child autistic by being a cold or unloving or refrigerator parent. But early twin studies that showed the difference in concordance between identical twins and fraternal twins suggested that instead autism was strongly genetic and that the peculiarities in some of the parents that early researchers were picking up were in fact signs of that heritability rather than causing the difficulties in the child. There have been, there's been a lot of work trying to find the genetic basis for autism with so far relatively little replication or success. This just illustrates the vast range of different loci that have been implicated in autism spectrum disorders. And again, you can see some of those genes listed here. Dan Geschwind has taken a, an approach of network mapping to try and find genetic networks that might uh, connect some of these different loci. But one of the major limitations is that many findings go unreplicated. And this is true both in the genetic work and in the search for the brain basis of autism. So why is that? Well, one possibility is that our groups, our sample sizes are just too small, and we don't have power to find the maybe genes, many genes of small effect uh, that are operating. But I also think that heterogeneity is very important. We may be mixing apples and oranges, and one of the recent moves in uh, the genetics of autism has been to distinguish between de novo cases, cases where uh, a child has autism uh, due to a spontaneous mutation just for that individual, and familial cases where you can see little signs of autism in other family members. Some of the better established findings including, include accelerated head growth and larger than usual head by the age of about four years in a subsample of children with autism. Um, so these children are born with ordinary head size, ordinary brain size, but by age four, they show megalencephaly. Uh, even that finding is beginning to be questioned now with some people suggesting that if you measure the bodies as well, these children are just growing very fast. It's not special to their, to their head circumference. There's uh, good evidence of some dysmorphologies from early pregnancy and Perkin G cell abnormalities in cerebellum are one of the best replicated findings. And this is important because a lot of parents worry whether something that happened during the birth or something that happened in the early environment and people point at pollutants and chemicals might have influenced their child's autism. And the fact that there are signs dating back to the first trimester and certainly the second trimester is important in understanding what role these might have. <clears throat> and we know that many genes uh, must be involved uh, and we distinguish now de novo and familial cases. So at the moment, there's no blood test or chromosome test for autism, and instead, autism is diagnosed behaviorally. 
And here you see what's often described as the triad of impairments in autism. Social difficulties, communication problems, and rigid and repetitive behavior. And this triad of uh, impairments shows a spectrum of manifestations. So that if you look at a, a very young child with autism, you might see a, an obvious social impairment because the child seems to be happy as left alone, doesn't go to his or her mother even when hurt or distressed, and uh, certainly isn't seeking attention or um, pointing things out to mother or father. The communication impairments in this child are very evident. This might be a, a, a three-year-old who doesn't speak at all, but also doesn't turn around if his or her name is called. And the parents may even think the child is deaf until they notice that if they unwrap a sweet behind the child, they turn around straight away. So it seems to be a deafness for communication in particular. And the rigid and repetitive behavior in a young child with autism, again, can be very striking. A child who is, um, will be happy to spend hours watching water drip from their fingers or spinning the toy, toy wheels on a car. So that triad of impairments in that young child, as that child grows older, or maybe a different individual with less intellectual impairment, will change in manifestation. So you might see then a nine-year-old child with autism who is still socially unusual. <clears throat> now the child is happy to be around other people, is happy to engage in rough and tumble play with brother or sister or mom or dad, but <clears throat> can't make an ordinary friendship and is very passive, would never uh, make an overture towards a child and wouldn't really know how to play with another child. Their communication impairments may have changed. From the little boy who was silent, you may now have a child who talks a lot, talks a lot of the time, but what they say is largely repeated. They're showing echolalia. And one little boy I know um, echoes the uh, racing commentary from the radio with the perfect intonation and pitch. <clears throat> but he can't ask for something. He can't put language to use or put words together in a generative way. And his rigid and repetitive impairments are that he's very, very distressed by change. So if his mother takes a different route to school in the car, he'll become so upset that she has to stop the car to calm him down. Now, as that child grows into adulthood or another individual, the manifestation of impairments may change again. So now you have a social impairment that isn't being aloof or even passive, but a child or an adult who is socially very interested, very sociable, wants to have friends, but doesn't know how to do it. So this young man may think that the girl at the checkout in the supermarket is his uh, fr girlfriend because she smiles at him. And he, he may think it's a good idea to uh, run down the street after her and uh, surprise her if he sees her walking home late at night. You can see that that social impairment is just as difficult to live with as being socially aloof, um, but the manifestation has changed. The communication impairments will have changed. This kind of an individual, often described as having Asperger's syndrome, may have very fluent language and like to monologue about their own special interests like I'm doing now, but doesn't understand if somebody's joking or being sarcastic and tends to take everything literally. This person's rigid and repetitive behavior might be a very well-developed understanding of mathematics or astronomy, um, and uh, it's still rigid because they're outside their interests. Uh, they uh, can't be engaged at all. So this uh, range of impairments uh, is the, forms the basis for diagnosis. Now, in the recently published DSM-5, uh, there have been some changes to the diagnostic system, and if anyone's interested in those, I'm happy to talk during questions about them. I was in, in the work group that was putting together those criteria, so if people are curious about how criteria for these kinds of conditions get put together, I'm happy to talk about that later. So with that wide spectrum of manifestations and wide range of abilities going all the way from a, a child with intellectual impairment to an individual with superior, higher than normal IQ, we get uh, a very variable set of outcomes with some individuals man managing to find a niche and have a product productive and happy life and other individuals needing uh, care, uh, needing support their whole lifetimes and some individuals, for example, never acquiring useful language. We know that expert education works. We know that the outcome for children with autism has improved enormously over the last 10 or 15 years because of education that takes into account the way that people with autism see and understand the world. But there's still a big puzzle. And the heterogeneity in autism, 
is one of the major stumbling blocks to research. So the question is, are we mixing apples and oranges? When we search for the genes for autism, are we going about it the wrong way because of the heterogeneity within those that we use this label for? So what I want to present uh, this evening are some ideas about why autism is so difficult to research and some pointers about how we might make more progress. <clears throat> so the first pointer has to do with the triad of impairments that I've just described to you and questioning whether the triad of impairments should be seen as a monolith where it's traditionally been thought that the social and the communication and the rigid and repetitive aspects of autism represent different facets of the same thing, of one thing, or should we think of them as a composite, a set of different difficulties that come together in the individual with autism? So to answer this question, we need to begin by knowing something about how closely tied together those three areas of difficulty or difference are. And the stumbling block in research uh, up until recently has been that most studies have happened in clinics. And if you study a population that's diagnosed with autism, then you can see there's a circularity because to get the diagnosis, you have to have all three areas of difficulty. So we can't really study how closely bound or how separable these different aspects of the triad are. So um, what we did was use the Twins Early Development Study, which is a population-based study of all the twins born in England and Wales in 94, 95, and 96. And it's a representative sample of the general population. Um, and they've been, sorry, they've been assessed at a range of ages from um, two uh, onwards, and they're being assessed uh, now at 16 and 18. And we realized that by looking at a general population sample, we could ask the question, how closely bound are social and communication impairments and rigid and repetitive traits, or are these things dissociable in the general population? So Angelica Ronald, um, who was doing a PhD with uh, Rob Plowman and myself at the time, explored this question. And here you can see the phenotypic correlations between traits of social difficulties or skills, traits of communication difficulties or skills, and rigid and repetitive interests. And what we did was ask parents to tell us about their children, all the children, uh, whether they were on the, in the ordinary range or in a clinical range, because all the parents could answer questions like, how uh, good is your child at making and keeping friendships? How good is he or she at having a two-way conversation? And what you can see is that the correlation between individual differences on these three traits um, is moderate. And I suppose this is a question of uh, glass half full, glass half empty, whether you think these are high or low correlations. For me, coming from an autism perspective, these were surprisingly low correlations um, because, for example, we had really thought of social impairments and communication impairments as inextricably linked. And in DSM-5, they form um, one axis of the diagnosis because it's almost impossible to think of a piece of social behavior that doesn't involve communication or vice versa. But here you can see that the correlations are only moderate, so you get quite a lot of variation in how good you are in communication that is independent of how good you are at social interaction. And that was at age eight in the general population. Katarina Dworsinski looked at the extreme, looked at people who uh, met autism criteria, and found the correlation between social and communication was a bit closer when you looked at impairment, but the correlation with the rigid and repetitive interests was rather low. Now, because this is a twin sample, we can go beyond phenotypic correlations. And first of all, we can ask how heritable individual differences are in each aspect of the triad. So by comparing the identical and non-identical twins, we can estimate the environmental and the genetic influences on individual differences. And you can see that the uh, correlation between twins um, how similar the twins are is much, much higher for identical than for non-identical twins for all of these traits. So each of these traits is highly heritable in itself. But we can go beyond that and we can look at how similar uh, twin one's social ability is to twin two's repetitive and rigid traits. So that cross-twin, cross-trait correlation when we compare identical and non-identical twins, will give us an idea about whether overlapping genetic or environmental factors influence these different aspects of the triad. So uh, this shows you the genetic uh, association, the genetic correlation 
between different aspects of the triad and gives you an estimate of how much genetic overlap there is on the influences for each of these aspects of the triad. And you can see again that the correlations are moderate, and that means that uh, for these different traits, more than half of the genetic influences on, say, social ability or difficulties is specific to social difficulties or abilities and not shared with other aspects of the triad. <clears throat> and the same applies when you look at the extreme. So the idea that the different parts of the triad might have largely independent genetic influences was very striking when we first found it, but we were somewhat reassured um, by the fact that this chimes in with what family studies have told us in a more informal way for a long time. So if you look in the families of those with autism, some families will, will show evidence of the broader autism phenotype, signs, usually subclinical signs, of autistic-like traits in other members of the family. And when you look at those family pedigrees, what you find is that great aunt uh, Josephine might be socially a bit odd, and there might be an uncle who has a fantastic eye for detail and is a, a computer engineer, um, but you don't necessarily find that the individuals who have the non-social traits also have the social traits. So we already know that in the family pedigrees, these different parts that we call the autism triad can be separated, or as we've called it, fractionated. <clears throat> so um, in our research, a number of students working with me have also shown that different features that are associated with autism, although not definitional to autism, show a differential association with different parts of the triad, again suggesting that we should think of autism as a compound disorder, perhaps. So Fiona McEwen, for example, showed that um, imitation abilities at age two in TEDS um, strongly predicted later social impairments and to some degree later communication difficulties, but had no predictive relationship to rigid and repetitive traits. Victoria Hallett showed that anxiety, which is a, a comorbidity of enormous impact in people with autism, showed a, a, a relationship, strong relationship to communication impairments, some relationship to rigid and repetitive traits, but to our surprise, very little relationship to how socially skilled or socially impaired an individual was. And Pedro Vital um, looked to the relationship with special abilities, and I'll come to back, back to that one later. <clears throat> So we postulated that there are somewhat separate and distinct causes for the different parts of the triad. And if that's the case, then we have to predict that you should be able to find isolated symptoms. You should find individuals who only have social difficulties without, for example, communication or rigid and repetitive traits. So in the TEDS population, that population-based sample, we could ask how tightly bound are the different triad features and how often do you find um, a triad difficulty on its own? So what we did for this um, analysis was define being impaired as being in the worst 5% for one of these traits. So the worst 5% of that large population of twins in terms of, say, your social skills. And then we could calculate what would be expected by chance alone, and we could look at whether there was clustering of features. And as you can see here, there is indeed some clustering of features, and uh, the uh, co-occurrence of the three areas of difficulty is above chance, but by far and away the largest group is composed of individuals who have difficulties in a single area of the triad, and that amounts to about 10% of the population in total who have, for example, just social difficulties, or just rigid and repetitive traits, or just communication difficulties. And it remains an interesting question what these children are like. <clears throat> now, I'm a... a cognitive uh, neuroscientist by background, and most of my work has been trying to understand how people with autism see and, and process and understand the world around them. And for many years, uh, the psychology and the cognitive science of autism attempted to find a single explanation for the different symptoms of autism. And I think overall there's been a real failure to find a single parsimonious explanation, but we have a number of good th candidate theories. And the finding that there might be separable genetic bases for the different parts of the triad casts, this, um, the, casts the cognitive work in a new light. So in different parts of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, different cognitive theories of autism. Um, but the work I've just told you about, the idea that the triad might be fractionable, 
suggests that the underlying cognitive explanations for the different parts of autism may also be fractionable, that we may find people who have theory of mind impairments, for example, who, but don't have problems in executive function, who have the autistic eye for detail, but don't have uh, problems of social cognition. And so um, I just want to say something about, about that, and then I'll return in more detail to some of these theories later on. So if we think of autism as a composite of cognitive features, where children have both difficulty in reading other people's minds, difficulty in putting information together or uh, superior ability to see detail, uh, and difficulty in planning and, and uh, monitoring their behavior, which is often termed executive dysfunction, then we need to again predict that you may find individuals who have difficulties in only one of these areas if they're not inextricably linked. And so, for example, we've suggested that uh, in ADHD, which is well known to involve executive function impairments, you don't find uh, the associated impairments in, say, eye for detail or um, putting information together. So just to give you an example from our work, um, we asked children with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or children with autism to draw a house like the one we showed them. And we looked at how they drew it. And we looked in particular whether they began their drawing with detail or showed a particular attention to detail in the drawing. And here you can see the drawing of a young man with autism who begins with the windows, which is rather unusual for a typically developing child. So scoring their drawings for eye for detail, the children with autism really stand apart from the typically developing or the ADHD groups. But then we also gave them a test of planning, which has to do with executive function. We showed them, for example, a picture of a snowman. We asked them to draw a picture like ours. And here you can see a picture of a snowman drawn by a young man, a typically developing young man. And then we said, now draw me a snowman with teeth. And what we're looking for is planning ahead to allow space for the new element. So you need to, for example, make the, the head a bit bigger. And we could score up that planning ability and we found that both children with autism and children with ADHD were poor at planning in that task, but that ability in terms of planning and ability in terms of eye for detail were not correlated and were distinct. So that suggests that different aspects of the cognitive phenotype of autism can, can be pulled apart in other groups. We've also uh, been interested in working with uh, eating disorder clinic at the Institute of Psychiatry where they've found uh, an eye for detail that we find in autism, they've found also in women with anorexia and other eating disorders. Um, but these women don't have, for example, executive function problems and don't have uh, severe social cognition problems of the type seen in autism. So again, it suggests that the different components of cognition in autism can be pulled apart. And we've also worked with um, a group of very interesting children and adults who have colossal agenesis, so they're born without a corpus callosum. And these uh, individuals, who often do remarkably well, it's very striking, um, but they quite often show social difficulties that perhaps suggest they're not able to intuit what other people are thinking in the way, just the same way that we see in autism. So the implications of this fractionated triad view is that perhaps we should abandon searches for the causes of autism as a monolith, so most genetic approaches look for genes associated with autism as a whole. And uh, if you're marking up your pedigree, your large family study, you're going to mark in who actually has autism or maybe who has subclinical, uh, just misses autistic diagnostic criteria. But maybe instead we'd be better off looking for the genetic basis of a particular part of the autism triad. For example, measuring social skill or social difficulty and looking at the genes that are associated with that. Um, this approach also suggests that no single factor, either genetic or neural or cognitive, has to be specific to autism. And that's important because in the past, people have, for example, uh, discounted executive functions as important in autism because they've said, well, lots of groups have executive function problems. ADHD children, for example, have executive function problems. And that's true. But if autism is a, a as a compound, is a mixture of different difficulties, then no one ingredient in that compound has to be specific to autism. And that means we may be able to learn a lot about autism by studying other conditions. <clears throat> and we'd expect overlap with other diagnoses because of that. And actually, that's the case. So increasingly, it's recognized that 
um, vast comorbidity is the norm, that a child who just has autism is very, very unusual. And anxiety and depression, for example, but also ADHD or inattention and um, coordination difficulties are very much the norm in autism. And if your social and your communication difficulties and your rigid and repetitive traits are orthogonal to one another, then of course heterogeneity in the autism spectrum is to be expected. There's not going to be necessarily grouping. You may see every possible pattern that there could be. And as that study on overlap highlighted, there are children out there who have difficulties in only one area. They would not have an autism diagnosis. They wouldn't meet criteria for autism. And we just don't know what their level of need might be or uh, what service if, services, if any, they receive. <clears throat> so that was the first pointer. The next pointer um, is digging down into the idea that autism isn't just a deficit, but is a different cognitive style. So I mentioned I for detail already. And uh, one uh, cognitive theory about autism suggests that we can understand some of the difficulties, but also the assets in non-social areas that people with autism show by thinking of autism as a different cognitive style and particularly an eye for detail. So I became interested in this um, account when Lorna Wing told me about testing a young man with autism and asking him to name all the toys that were going to be used in the assessment. And he named the toy bed and the quilt and so on. And she pointed to the little toy pillow and said, what's this? And the boy said, it's a piece of ravioli. And what was interesting to me about the anecdote was that Lorna said, when she looked again at the pillow, it looked exactly like a piece of ravioli. It was exactly the right shape and color and size, but she would never have seen it that way. So it wasn't that the boy had misperceived, but that he had been able to see something, in a sense, more accurately, because he could see it free from its context. And this idea that people with autism zoom in on details and are relatively resistant to context or the big picture <clears throat> has been quite influential both in a number of research studies, but also at grassroots level in people's understanding of autism. And here you can see a poster from the National Autistic Society from a few years back. <clears throat> and it says, when a person with autism walks into a room, the first thing they see is a pillow with a coffee stain shaped like Africa, a train ticket sticking out of a magazine, 25 floorboards, a remote control, a paper clip on the mantelpiece, a, crack, a, a marble under the chair, a crack in the ceiling, and it carries on at the bottom, it says, so it's hardly surprising they ignore you completely. So the idea of seeing the world at a level of detail that the rest of us miss um, has been an important clue to what's going on in autism. And people with autism, as well as finding the social world difficult, often find many non-social tests surprisingly easy. So this is the embedded figures task. Your, your job is to find the simple small shape within the large compound shape. And one of the reasons it's difficult is that there's a camouflaging effect of seeing the whole shape rather than seeing it in terms of its parts. But people with autism, even people with autism who have low measured IQ and maybe nonverbal, are often surprisingly good at this. So we often say that people with autism get distressed by tiny changes in the environment. But clearly, if you see the world in terms of details, then things that may not bother you and I may be very, very important to a child or an adult with autism. And we've suggested that this eye for detail and the ability to see the world free from context uh, go some way towards explaining why autism is so strongly associated with talents. So when one talks about autism and talents, you run the risk of um, creating a stereotype that's not helpful. And I know many parents of children with autism who are very upset by, um, for example, films like Rain Man, and after you know, a piece in the newspaper or a piece on the TV about talents and autism, their neighbors may come up to them and say, oh, you have a child with autism, you're so lucky, what's his special talent? And of course, the parents want to say, well, my child's special talent is uh, getting so upset by the fluorescent lights in the supermarket that he lies down under the trolley and has a tantrum. But it is the case that uh, around 30% of children and adults with autism are unusually good at something. And that stands in contrast to their other abilities. And that a much greater number of individuals on the autism spectrum than in any other single group show remarkable talents in maths or music, art or memory. And here you can see Stephen Wiltshire drawing from memory the cityscape of Tokyo having taken a 20 minute helicopter ride over the city. And you can see the horses drawn by Nadia when she was three and unable to do up her own buttons 
or use a knife and fork. But you can also see a young man with autism who's lined up all his toys, and when he wakes up, if any of those toys have been moved even a fraction of an inch, he's going to be very, very, very upset. And his parents may not think that's a talent because it makes life so hard for him and for them, but it is a talent because most of us couldn't notice that level of change. And so the idea that eye for detail is important in talent um, has been influential, and we decided to test it again by using that twin design and using the twin sample of Ted's. So Pedro Vital um, asked the parents of eight-year-old twins in Ted's about their children's autistic-like traits, the, that um, measure of, of individual differences in social skills and communication and rigidity. But he also asked them, is your child unusually good at something? Much better even than children a lot older than him or her. And we asked them to tick if it was maths and memory, art or music or something else. The something else was such a mixed bag of uh, drama and dance and sport and sense of humor that we left it out of this particular analysis. But we looked at the association between autistic-like traits and report of special gifts. And what we found was that children with or without autism, whose parents said that they were unusually good at something, were also said by their parents to show more autistic-like traits and specifically to show more rigid and repetitive traits. And uh, because of the ability to do twin modeling, we could look at the overlapping or distinct genetic contribution to those two different individual differences. And what we found was that there was a, a substantial shared genetic component that was contributing both to the individual differences in autistic-like um, rigid repetitive traits and in uh, the tendency to have superior talent in one of those areas of maths, music, art, or memory. So, put simplistically, some of the genes predisposing to autism also predisposed to talent. And when we dug down into the items that were really driving that, uh, it was most driven not by something like um, repetition and obsession, which we thought it might be. We thought it might be to do with practice, but it actually related most closely to memory for and eye for detail. Now, that tendency to see the world in terms of detail may also present some challenges. And one of the areas that people with autism and their carers have long asked people, researchers, to pay more attention to are the sensory difficulties. And for many, many years, there was hardly any work, any research on sensory abnormalities in autism. And these have just come into the DSM-5 criteria as one of the ways that you can show your rigid and repetitive behavior to meet the criteria for autism spectrum conditions. But people with autism, many people with autism, of course, other groups as well, it's not specific to autism, but many people with autism have pronounced sensory sensitivities. They may really dislike fluorescent lights or particular sounds. They may, children may wear, want to wear their hoods up all the time because the sound of the wind went, that we wouldn't even notice is very distressing. They may very much dislike particular um, sensations of light touch or particular textures of food so that their diet becomes very restricted. Um, or be very sensitive to smells so that they can't bear to be in the school um, dining room because of the compound of different smells. And we wondered whether some of this sensitivity, but also fascination, because of course people with autism get very fascinated by um, you know, flicking lights or um, particular uh, sensations they may want to touch or things they want to smell or lick. Um, some of this might have to do with that eye for detail and the tendency not to use context. And the reason we speculated that was that <clears throat> there's a literature in typical development that says, if you know the next sensation you're going to experience, then you experience it as less intense. So predicting from context um, your sensation is one of the ways that we moderate our experience of intensity uh, in perception. And so what Stephanie Litz, who you can see here, who did her PhD on sensory abnormalities in autism, what she did was try and devise a task that we could use across the autism spectrum, even with children who didn't have very much speech, in order to measure whether they were using context to modify their experience of different sensory modalities. So, for example, she would give the children a, a little bit of context, a tiny sort of story. So she might say, um, Sarah was going to school, she reached in the cupboard for her coat. And then the child would get to put his or her hand into an opaque box. 
And they might feel cloth, which would be congruent with the context, or they might feel dry leaves, which would be very incongruent with the context. And for the children who had um, expressive language, we would ask them how much they liked the sensation and how intense it was. But for all the children, much more importantly, we just measured how long they chose to keep their hand in that box as a marker of how interested they were in the stimuli. And we did the same for holding a headphone up to your ear. How long would you choose to hold it up there to continue to hear a sound, either that you expected based on context or that was incongruent and unexpected? How long they chose to um, uh, smell something by, by squeezing a little bottle or see something by holding up the lid on a, on a screen? <clears throat> and what Stephanie found was that compared to no context, the children with autism weren't context sensitive. So typically developing children put, kept their hand inside the box for longer and were more interested in exploring the, the sensation if it was unexpected based on context. But for children with autism, there was very little effect of preceding context. So we think that maybe this is the beginning of a clue to why sensory experience in autism may be very different. OK. My next signpost has to do with taking development seriously. So for many years, we've known that people with autism have difficulty intuitively recognizing what somebody else might be thinking. And uh, this has been studied a great deal in um, people with autism. But we haven't always taken seriously how that changes the learning environment. So I want to suggest that reading minds in that intuitive way, having a sense of what somebody else might be thinking, what they know, what they don't know, um, opens doors to development, is a gatekeeper in development. So here you see two little boys. And the boy, shown in black and white, might be a neurotypical child, a child without autism. And he's playing, but he's as interested in his parents' response to his play as he is in the play itself. And you know, too, that um, the fascination in other people's minds is almost overwhelming. We can't turn it off. So if you walk down the street, you see lots of people pointing up at something. You can't help but look to. And in the same way, this little boy can't help but orient to and look to the people in his environment, to follow their pointing gestures, to follow where they happen to look, to read information from their faces. So his learning environment is very shaped by his social environment. By contrast, the little boy in color might be a child with autism who's interested in what he's interested in. He's playing, and he's not, uh, not monitoring what his parents think about it. He's not rewarded by their smile. He's interested and rewarded by engaging in what he's interested in. So the child with autism grows up in a much more um, uh, less socially infused and, in a sense, more, more insulated or isolated world where they're learning things not through the people around them, but through their own interaction with the physical world. And there are a whole range of downstream effects of this mind blindness or this insulation from other minds. And, for example, we've looked at whether people with autism also have difficulty knowing what they themselves are thinking, reflecting on their own thoughts, knowing whether something they did was accidental or on purpose, for example. We've looked at the impact of um, this social insulation in terms of learning and intelligence, and we've found that the performance of children with autism on intelligence tests, on standard intelligence tests, probably underestimates their true learning capacity because the skills that we measure in intelligence tests show the, the um, end product of learning in a social environment. And if you're not learning from others, then your potential for learning won't be cashed out in the way that we test in those typical assessments. But that if you look at potential for learning, you can see good learning potential far above IQ measures in people with autism. And I'm happy to talk more about that during questions. We've also um, explored a little bit the impact on language learning, because in typical development, the way that children learn new words is by tracking the speaker's intention. And that's why a young child will learn a new word if you point to an object and you label it and you make eye contact with the child and you show your intention to teach. But they won't learn a new word just by happening to overhear you on the phone talking to somebody else. 
while they happen to look at a new toy for which they don't have a name. So it's not a statistical mapping, it's a mapping of an intention um, onto uh, a new um, word learned. And people with autism show very unusual patterns of, for example, first words. So when we asked parents about their children with autism's first words, um, they were sometimes whole phrases. So instead of mama or dada being the first word, it might be snip, snip, went the scissors. Um, or uh, in one case, a child uh, used the word beer, meaning ice cream, routinely. And you can imagine how that mismapping might happen if you're not taking into account the learning environment. Um, and also, that words come in and go out of children with autism vocabulary. So they'll say a word a few times and then never again. That doesn't happen in typical development. And so again, it's just that maybe the child has tried to pick up on some statistical regularity, they made a mismapping, it hasn't worked for them, they've dropped it. And maybe this again begins, begins to give us some insight into why some people with autism never develop useful language at all. So downstream effects may be very important to consider. Because of course, if they're downstream, we could potentially reroute the, the stream and we could teach children in non-social ways so that their learning capacity is fully um, utilized. I also want to make the point that social insight has costs. So I've hinted at the fact that you can't really turn off your theory of mind. You can't stop absorbing information from other people because we're such inherently social beings that it's automatic to orient to other people, to take information from their faces, their voices, um, their body language, from everything about them. And so um, the cartoon that says, uh, shows a panel of judges and one of them saying, well, heck, if all you smart cookies agree, who am I to argue, illustrates a very genuine um, phenomenon to do with tipping point that the first judge may give his own personal opinion, the second judge gives his opinion um, inextricably colored by the first judge's opinion. Whether he wants to or not, he's automatically influenced and so on. And that actually has a snowball effect that can be extremely harmful in some circumstances. And so we have a, a danger of conformity. And uh, there's a study by um, Liz Belke's lab that shows that even at the age of three, typically developing children will say they prefer a novel object or game or toy that they've seen a child of their own age and gender choose. And when you ask the child why they chose that um, object, or they don't say, oh, because she liked it and I'd like to play with her. They say, it's the best one. I always like those sort. So children have no insight into the fact that they're being affected by this herd mentality. And it begins very, very early. And there's also some evidence that it may curtail some of our exploration and some of our um, real imagination and investigation. So in some learning experiments from, again, this Belkis lab, Children uh, are very shaped by what teachers teach them, and they tend not to explore beyond what teachers teach them. Whereas if you leave them to freely explore, they actually find out much more. So sometimes our assumptions about other people's minds and intentions actually curtail our learning opportunities. And that may explain, again, something about autistic originality and maybe something about the flavor of autistic talents. Because you can imagine that because of our herd mentality, all of us neurotypicals, non-autistic people, are wearing blinkers from shared thoughts. And Temple Grandin likes to say, Temple Grandin is a very um, a highly intelligent, highly successful professor in the States who has autism. Um, and there was a film made about her life fairly recently. And she likes to say, if it had been left to all you neurotypicals without autism, we'd all still be sitting around in caves gossiping. And it took somebody with autism to get up and walk away from that because they found it so boring and go and invent the wheel or discover how to make fire. But the blinkers we have from shared thoughts means it's very hard to think something truly original, completely unaffected by other people's thoughts. People with autism may not wear those blinkers. And similarly, people with autism often have what we call savant skills. Uh, but uh, all of us have skills that somebody coming from another planet might think were savant skills. We all recognize as familiar thousands upon thousands of faces, for example. And that's probably as impressive in some ways as memorizing you know, half a telephone directory like some people with autism do. It's just that we can all do it, so we don't think it's surprising. We obviously use both time and neural resources, brain power, to do that. And maybe people with autism, who often aren't terribly good with faces, are, are reassigning uh, some of both their time and their neural resources to these other areas of talent. 
And much more speculatively, as I mentioned, we've looked at whether problems of reading minds applies also to your own mind in autism. And in uh, some areas of talent, particularly sports, people are very interested in the notion of flow, of being in a state of flow where you're relatively unselfconscious and you may be more productive uh, and uh, more able to achieve in certain sorts of fields. So maybe people with autism who are less self-conscious can enter a state of flow more easily. <clears throat> um, my next flag, oh, sorry, the second part of the flag about development is to think about old age. And this won't take long because the reason to put this as a flag is that we know nothing about old age in autism. So when I was involved in the DSM-5 process, we were told to try and make our criteria applicable across the age span. And so I thought, well, I must go and read up about old age in autism. And there is really nothing. And there's no research on old age in autism. And this is partly because autism was first named in the 40s and came into the diagnostic process mainly in the 60s. So the first generation of children who received the diagnosis are only now growing old. But of course, many elderly people come for diagnosis, sometimes come for diagnosis for the very first time. And in the clinic at the Institute of Psychiatry, they have individuals who came for first diagnosis in their 70s, having lived all their lives um, with a condition somewhere on the autism spectrum. Often misdiagnosed, um, but uh, sometimes struggling by, by without any clinical attention at all. Um, and then in their 70s, sometimes because a grandchild has been diagnosed, they recognize in themselves this pattern of difficulties. And if you're interested in aging and autism, the best thing you can read is not actually the review that, uh, that I wrote with Rebecca Charlton, but the magazine article about Donald T, who was Leo Kanner's first case that he describes in his classic paper, and at the age of 77, continues to learn new skills and to be very accepted in his small community in the States, um, where he's very autistic, but also uh, very functional and very happy. So it's an it's a excellent um, story. Of course, many people with autism are not so lucky. <clears throat> There's an urgent need for more research on autism and aging, and that's why this uh, signpost, this flag is here. You can see in this graph the um, number of publications on autism arranged according to the age group that was studied in the particular research. And although, as I said, most people with autism are adults, the vast majority of research is conducted with children, some with adolescents, some with young adults, and scarcely anything of, of any note with old people. <clears throat> and you can see that Joe Piven and others in the States have highlighted the need for more information. Uh, the next flag has to do with uh, women with autism. And again, because autism is much more common in males than females, often women with autism are entirely left out of autism research. If you're collecting a relatively small sample, you may get only a handful of women with autism, and then sometimes people will decide to leave them out of the analyses altogether. And so we really know very little about uh, women on the autism spectrum. The, uh, the statistics suggest that um, at the high ability end, where intellectual functioning is normal or superior, uh, there may be uh, six, ten to males to every female. At the lower ability end, a more balanced, but still probably two to two females to every one, uh, one, two males to every one female. On the one hand, this is probably reflective of a general biological vulnerability in the male. So we know that in almost all developmental disorders, with just a few notable exceptions, there are more males affected than females. This is true for dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, conduct disorder, and so on. Um, but it's also interesting to question whether perhaps we have a stereotype of autism that makes, it, makes us rather bad at recognizing autism in women. So um, there are different sorts of accounts for uh, what's going on with that uh, bias. Uh, and one account is the female protective effect. So it's been suggested that in order to, um, for a, a woman or a girl to show autism, you have to give them a larger etiological hit than you do a male. So you have to load up the, the genetic um, burden or the other kind of etiological burden in order to tip a girl over the boundary into autism compared to a male. And at least Robinson, working with Angelica Ronald and I, tested that in the TED sample and also in the Swedish um, twin register by looking at the siblings of people who show high autistic traits. And what they found was that uh, the, the siblings of, uh, of girls 
show a much higher rate of um, autistic-like traits than the siblings of boys who identified as being autistic-like. So that means that when you find a girl who has been tipped into high autistic traits, the loading in that family, the etiological loading in that family, seems to be greater, and that spills on over into the siblings, and you can see it there. But I'm also very interested in whether part of the, the, um, g the gender bias has to do with failure to diagnose true cases of autism in women. And what we did was, um, again, look at the population sample, and we asked the question, what makes the difference between girls who get diagnosed and girls who don't. So we found uh, in the TED sample, uh, girls who had lots of autistic-like traits, they were high on this measure cast, and had as many autistic-like traits as another sample of girls who actually met diagnostic criteria. And so we could say, what's the difference? Why do some of these guys meet, some of these girls meet diagnostic criteria and some of them don't? We could ask the same question in males. And it turns out that for girls, but not boys, the girls who, get, who meet diagnostic criteria are very likely also to have low IQ or to have additional behavioral problems that teachers notice. And that tends to mean externalizing, inattention, conduct type problems. And so it suggests one of two things. Either girls who um, don't have these additional problems fly under the radar, and we don't notice them and we don't help them, or that if a girl only has autism but doesn't have any other burdens to carry, as it were, they can actually compensate fairly well. Now, for boys, that doesn't seem to be the case. There wasn't that predictor whether you met criteria or not based on these additional burdens. So it suggests something different is happening for girls. But I think unless we go and actually ask women and girls with autism about their experience, about whether they're suffering in silence, being missed, or whether they're compensating well, we don't know which of those explanations is closer to the truth. So I'm almost finished, and I want to finish up with one more marker, which is really a plea that to understand autism and many other disorders, we really need to understand the mind. There's a real place for cognitive theories, for psychological theories. And um, in the States, research on autism is really almost entirely uh, at the biological level. So there are studies of behavior in terms of treatment response, and uh, educational effects, but there's really no interest in what autism is at the psychological level because the holy grail of research is to find the genes or to find what's different in the brain. And <clears throat> it seems to me that in a condition like Down syndrome where we know exactly what happens in the genes, it hasn't actually advanced our understanding of people with Down syndrome uh, at all. It hasn't helped us to know how to educationally uh, meet the needs of a child with Down syndrome. And in autism, where by contrast we really don't know the genetic mechanism, we know a lot about how to help educationally. And that's because time has been spent trying to understand how people with autism see and process the world. And even if you're not convinced by that argument, until we know the genes, until we know the brain basis, actually cognitive theories are our best way in. So when, um, just before I started in the area of autism, uh, the view of autism was that children with autism were not socially interested. They didn't engage with the social world. Now, if that's your theory of autism, it's very hard to do, for example, a neuroimaging study of autism because you can't possibly put an ordinary person in the scanner and ask them, well, now, could you just lie there and be socially interested? And then we'll find out what brain regions you use, and then we'll go and see whether people with autism have abnormalities in those brain regions. But as soon as there was the notion of abnormalities in theory of mind, that people with autism might be socially interested, but they couldn't form a specific type of representation, a representation and recognition of other people's mental states, then it's easy to put an ordinary person in the scanner and ask them, give them tasks that require them to read another person's mind, to work out what I'm thinking. And that was the beginning of a very fruitful line of research that identified a network of brain regions that are uh, routinely and reliably active when you and I are guessing and thinking about what other people think and are abnormal in people with autism. It's also the case that if you're really interested in finding the genes involved in autism, then you probably want to go beyond marking up your pedigrees for whether somebody has autism or not. And maybe you should be interested in whether people in that family pedigree have special talents 
because I've hopefully demonstrated that there's a genetic overlap there. So identifying who is affected uh, should take into account cognitive theories. And even if you're not really interested in people, you're interested in mouse models, you should still be interested in what the underlying basis is of the behavior that you're trying to track. Because if, for example, you start with noticing that people with autism <clears throat> are not very good at processing faces, and you want to translate that into a mouse model, you need to have an underlying theory of why people with autism are different in how they process faces. If you think it's because people with autism don't look at faces very much, it's a social problem, and therefore they don't become face experts, then your mouse model should translate that into something like olfaction, because that's how mice recognize one another, that's how mice show they're interested in one another. But if your theory of face recognition problems in autism is that because people with autism are zooming in on details, then they make mistakes because they're not looking at the whole face, then you don't want to use olfaction because you can't look at parts and holes in olfaction. You can't look at detail-focused processing. But you could easily interrogate that with a mouse using visual stimuli. So it really matters that you think below the level of behavior, even if what you're interested in is the brains or the genes. And these theories have also had a lot of impact in terms of recognition of autism, understanding, and educational intervention. There's some examples here which I'm happy to talk about during questions if people want. But for the sake of time, I'll, I'll finish up. I've tried to suggest that we'll understand autism better when we reconceptualize autism as a composite rather than a monolith, when we understand autism as in part a different cognitive style, not just a deficit. And we think about the developmental effects through the whole of the lifespan into old age that we need to know much more about women with autism, and we really need to know about how people with autism understand and see the world. And uh, one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years or so is a proliferation of autobiographies by people with autism and much more um, input from people with autism into research itself, and I think that's all been a very good thing. So um, I'll finish up. Lots of people to thank, and thank you very much for your attention. Please ask questions, but also if you want to get in touch after the lecture, my email's there, and I'm happy to hear from anyone who's interested in autism. Thank you very much.